Paul Kirkham. I have um, fallen into a lifestyle of coping with life, utilizing many addictive uh, behaviors. Of course, that could be a drug, uh, could be uh, violence, it could be pornography. I just tended to come into that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of how I, how, how I developed that addiction to coping with life that way and kind of what led to it uh, and kind of where I'm at today and how I have become to overcome that. But first I'm going to start by reading a verse in Luke, actually several verses in Luke, but it's a, it's a passage. And so it's called, um, Jesus is anointed by a sinful woman or person, we would say. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, he said this to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him, and what kind of woman or person that she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, he didn't even look at the man, he looked over at Simon. He said, Simon, I have something to tell you. And Simon says, tell me, teacher. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Which of them will love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Jesus says, you have judged correctly. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. I came, I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet, on, on my, yeah, my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, her many sins, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. So this is a story of forgiveness. I, uh, I was born, uh, like many of us, to uh, parents that were just broken. They didn't really have any idea how to be parents, and they made a lot of unhealthy decisions that affected the way that I perceived people men and women alike. Uh, my dad's mother had, uh, my dad's mother, so my grandma, had hung herself when my dad was just 11. So as, as you can understand, my dad had detached relationally because of that. You know, I can only imagine my mama, you know, killing herself, choosing death over parenting me. That happened to my dad. So my dad raised me with that uh, broken lens that he looked through as he did that. And I was kind of just a child in that. And my mom, as a result of that detached um, uh, characteristic, had an affair on my dad. And so now I'm seeing women through the lens of distrust and uh, pain. So I'm seeing my, a detached man that doesn't know how to communicate, a woman that chooses another man over her family. And so then my life began to spiral out of control. So now I'm scared. I really don't know what I'm doing. Um, and the two people I'm called to trust, I really didn't know how to be, I don't know, healthy parents. A lot of us have experienced some level of abandonment in our parental um, uh, uh, dynamic. Whether our parent has decided to use drugs or alcohol, they've committed adultery, killed themselves, left the house, we don't know them at all. Whatever it might look like, a lot of us have experienced abandonment to some extent when it comes to our father or mother, even both. And so that was what kind of took place with me. They had abandoned me relationally in so many different ways. That scared the heck out of a kid, you know, that I can't really look to my parents to trust them. So at 15 years old, I ran, I ran away from home at 15 years old. I joined a street crew, uh, lived in, you know, with a, a street mom, you know, and lived at the house and we broke into cars, robbed people, sold drugs, you know, vile, just the mess that is, criminal, unhealthy, survivalistic behavior. You know, we're just, I'm just trying to make it. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm a stupid little kid uh, acting like a grown up, listening to Easy E and Snoop Dogg and thinking what they were saying was, was real and valuable. 
was deceived, but it seemed like the thing to do, so I did it. About 15 days after I turned 18, I was arrested for a string of felonies, and I was thrown into a Duval County, Florida jail, which is not where I wanted to be, <laughs> obviously, and um, life got real quick. And so at that point, I remember uh, getting called to, to the chaplain's office, like a few days in, I'm scared to death. You know, um, I've been playing games, you know, in a real man's world, acting like I had some answers for a long time. And I wasn't fooling nobody when I'm stuck in the top bunk surrounded by tigers that knew what was really going on. Scared me to death. So anyway, I was getting called to the chaplain's office and I sit across this chaplain's desk and I see my name written in pencil, in pencil on his desk. And these weren't some electronic kites or whatever, kiosks, stuff. This was some God had intervened somewhere along the line to have me called out of my cell into this chaplain's office. So I began to see God's hand in my life. But, but to me, it made no sense because I knew me. I was a dumb little kid making a bunch of ridiculous mistakes. So why would a good God want to have anything to do with such a, a knucklehead guy? Anyway, so as I got out of jail, I tried to come up with some different approach to life that wasn't street activity, wasn't gang related, wasn't robbing people and being that idiot. So I took on the next persona, which was, hey, I can relate to ladies. They tend to pay attention to me. So we're gonna play this game for a while. So I became a player. And so I would manipulate and take advantage of the, the affinities of women as a way to survive. I mean, I'd work and I would still do my drugs and all that. Uh, just a mess of a man, breaking hearts every step of the way, never realizing that I was operating through broken lenses. The way that I saw women was detached. I would detach so that I wouldn't be hurt because I'd only allow a man to a certain extent, only allow him to have a certain part of who I was. And it wasn't relational, it was sexual. And, and that gets us nowhere really quick. So I would just break their heart. You know, they'd have a heart for me relationally or intimately, relationally, and I'd only allow them in sexually. And I'd hurt them. And so I realized looking back that the reason I did that was as a way to just keep them at arm's reach because I didn't want to get hurt. But when it came to men, I didn't trust them, obviously, because they didn't communicate. They were violent, they were hostile and angry because that's the way my dad uh, appeared to me. I mean, he did the best he could. So I kept them in arm's reach. I only allow guys, that, you know, that I never allow authority to take a part or play a part in my life. That's for sure, you can't trust authority. I don't know if anybody has struggled with having problems with authority here, but I know I have. And so I would just keep those guys over there, keep the girls within this little, you know, box of um, allowances in my life, the whole while protecting myself. Well, in 2014, after running from state to state, back and forth from Florida to here, trying to shake an addiction to coping with life in unhealthy ways, I was finally faced with my fifth violent crime, an aggravated assault in 2014. I was safely housed over in the Kootenai County Public Safety Building. I know now why they call it the Kootenai County Public Safety Building, because many times me being in there made the public safer. And so it was a good thing for me. I was in there, I was safe, the public was safe. I was sobering up. And I remember Pastor Tim Remington beginning to come to my court. And they were like, hey, that's Tim Remington and the good Sam and the ranch and all this. I'm like, I don't really care about none of that. I just know this, I don't wanna go back to where I came from. So Good Samaritan Ranch Prison, I don't really care. I just wanna go back. So I get court ordered to the Good, good Samaritan Rehabilitation Program too. And on July 3rd, I'm on the phone with my mom. And I'm like, Mom, you're supposed to be here to pick me up. She goes, Well, I'm going to make some phone calls. So, you know, Mom taking care of her little boy. How I'm 40 years old. I'm still her little boy and kind of acting like, really, I'm just a little kid uh, acting like I had some answers. But so, Mom calls the Good Samaritan Ranch and they get the ride there. So, I'm on the phone with my mom and I hear, Kirk, I'm up. I'm like, Mom, I love you. All right. I hung up the phone. I go, to the Good Samaritan Rehabilitation Program on July 4th, which was the next day. I remember eating a cheeseburger and drinking a Mountain Dew, just crying, going, man, this is way better than oatmeal. <laughs> this is not a hard boiled egg, so I don't have to open this thing. So it was just a really good deal. And then a couple days later, Stephen Hemming, hmm. former Pee Wee was his name back in the day, came up, he says, he was the administrator at the time. He says, Paul, the cops are gonna come talk to you. I'm like, oh God. 
Here we go. No, no, Paul, they're not going to arrest you. I'm like, yeah, they say that a lot. Like, they're always on us. <laughs> so we'll just see how this plays out. Sure enough, ISP shows up at the street. It had that one a week before Sean Hannah was being drug out of there by them over some federal charges. So I'm thinking the same thing. They come down, they hand me a note. My mom had died at 61 from a heart attack. And the last conversation I had with her was from Mary Pot. Well, I can tell you this, whenever life was getting tough, and my life up until that point, I would always call on my mama. Well, guess what? Mama wasn't there no more. But you know who was? That's right, my father. My heavenly father. I called out to God at that point. I said, God, I said, you know everything I've done. You probably know everything I've thought. And for that reason, why would it make any sense that you don't want to have anything to do with me? I said, but understand this. My mama is gone. And if you know me so well, I'm on the verge of getting a big bag of burn this world to the ground. I need you to get rid of me, God. And he did. And he touched me that day. And so from that point on, my life had radically been flipped upside down. Everything I thought was important wasn't. Everything I thought mattered didn't. You know, I, I realized that I was looking at life, men through broken lenses, women through broken lenses, but I needed a divine, a divine optometrist named Jesus Christ to show up. Amen. And he showed up. And don't get me wrong, I've been the king of relapse. I've had more relapses than I'd like to admit, but I will, because I'm honest. I'm walking the truth today. But I know this, that God is faithful, and he cannot deny himself. He is the author and the finisher of my faith and your faith. Amen. Being confident is the very thing that he who has begun a good work in us will complete it. He is a God of completion, and I am a testament to that right now standing here in front of you today to give him glory for no other reason than his goodness, not mine. You know, so what I realized was, and I want to hit on this, you know, I, whenever I relapsed after coming to know Jesus in 2014, I didn't want to sell guns anymore. I didn't want to hit people in the face anymore. I didn't want to uh, victimize or, or break any more hearts of women. I began to see women as what Denise had said, God's daughters. I'm like, I'm not messing that one up. So when I would relapse, what I would do was I'd jump behind a phone because I'm a former meth addict. And I'd buy into the, the counterfeit intimacy that pornography would bring to the table. And it just, it took me away. It protected me from women. I would, you can't get hurt, get broken heart from a lady when it's counterfeit. But I can tell you this. I'm free today. I have an accountability app on my phone today. I've got brothers and sisters, not sisters, brothers on the accountability app that if I was to make a bad decision when it comes to looking at things on my phone, that, that my brothers that love me enough would let me know, hey, listen, where are we going with this, right? There are men in this room that struggle with this right now, and they don't want to struggle the way, the way they are. But I can tell you this, there's hope. If this idiot, the porn prodigy, can overcome what I've overcome, the bondage that meth and pornography can bring into the life of an individual, then you can too. But it takes other people. And I can, I've had other people in my life, the Dave Sayers in the recovery community, the Miles Devins, the Rex Lataz. There are men in my life who come alongside of me through all of the ups and all of the downs, a lot of downs, and they don't give up on me. And so I'm going to finish with this, and that is that we're going to struggle. We're going to have ups and we're going to have my and downs. I'm just going to say this. I encourage you to do this. Be a man and admit when you're scared and you don't have the answer. Because honestly, very little of us do. And the ones that do, they're there for us. So we can reach out to the Daves and the Miles and the Reds. Right? So there's a lot of things about being a man that I'm learning as I go because I really thought I knew a lot of things and I didn't. And so today I can sit here and I can just say thank you. Thank you to Dave. And thank you for the men and the women that are a part of my life in this journey that haven't given up on me. I'm very thankful for this opportunity to share my testimony and uh, this time that you shared with me. Thank you. Yeah.